All right, so we are here. This is the data processing lesson. As you can see, uh, Kaggle.com, our friend, this is the one where I really like want to open it up so that you can go work on whatever you want because you're going to be using these skills 90% of the time with whatever you're doing. <laughs> so to be honest, this is a really important one. However, it's not too difficult. It is not too difficult. So I think this will be a simpler lesson and I'm happy for it because afterwards we have to learn a little bit of theory, but today you can just relax. If you wanna follow along as always, kaggle.com, go to this plus sign when you, you know, you might have to sign up, but you can click on a new notebook. And when you do, you'll get a notebook. It looks a little bit like this, except you won't have the code I do. Um, I wanted, I wanted to, again to guide you. So today's lesson, it's all about, you know, how do you get data? How do you find data? How do you process data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As you can see, I have a big long checklist of things that we're gonna go over. So just a few things to keep in mind. However, did wanna tell you, you know, how do you actually find data so that you can work with it? Uh, in Kaggle, of course, it's very easy. I'm dragging this section to the right, though I'm aware some of you might not be able to see it. There's this add data button on the right, which you might not be able to see. When you click on it, you can go and look through, you know, different Kaggle data sets. Oh, cool, Reddit vaccine myths. That's lovely. Um, but you can you can find like a bunch of fish, music, wiki books, whatever you want. So you have a bunch of data that you could add to your notebook like that. And even if you're not working in the Kaggle environment, let me also also show you another way to add data. Uh, can you guys let me know? Can you see like when I have a new tab open? Yes. Well, so whenever you're on Kaggle, you can always just search, you know, whatever data you want. What's something you're interested in? That's anyone. AI. No, oh, yeah, that's very useful. Aries? Well, I'm not sure if this is a thing, but like fake news. Fake news. All right. So let's say we're interested in fake news. Uh, fake news and real news data sets. <laughs> so you can find data set here. Uh, there's a bunch of notebooks. If you want to see, you know, what are other people doing? There are competitions. But you can filter by data sets. On the left, you'll have like different data set sizes, different formats. Uh, you might have like tags that you can filter with whenever you click into one of them. So let's say I click on this one, it has 1,204 upvotes. Seems, you know, pretty nice. Let's see what we have. So whenever you're here looking at the data sets, you often will get, you know, information in the description about what is the content. If not in the description, uh, you can also, you know, get data over here. So you can look at the detailed this, you know, here's the title, text, subject, whatever. You can switch over around like different views and see, you know, how many values, are there any missing, you know, how messy is the data? So these are all good things to explore about what might be fake versus real news. And oftentimes you'll see when it comes to uh, this data, it's often in CSV format. CSV is kind of like a format you'd see whenever you open up a spreadsheet. It has, it stands for comma separated values. And as you can, well, as you can imagine, they're quite literally comma separated values as in like one, two, three, and so on. So that's the most common format you'll see. And if you're ever, you know, not working on Kaggle, you can always just download the data and use it. So Kaggle is a great place to get data. You can also often get data by searching around on research papers. So if you have a very specific problem, try searching up, you know, AI algorithm, and then the pro problem maybe on sites like Google Scholar. And then oftentimes the researchers who work on these algorithms, they'll often 
you know, have a section talking about the data sources, how they got it, where they got it, is it open source, is it available somewhere? So that's also a good place to search. Sound good? All right, so that's how we can get data. Now, I am going to run through what do we do when we get data, how do we process it with a Python library called Pandas. Pandas is a very useful library. It just makes everything a lot more simple when you're dealing with comma separated values. We will be using the Titanic dataset. It's a very intro to machine learning dataset. I will be sure to share the link in the chat here and also in the recording description on YouTube. So you can always, uh, yeah, you might not be able to see this, but you can always get links to the data sets. And here is the one for Titanic in the chat, and I will post that in the description too. Uh, you can always go over to the data section. If it's part of a competition, like, you know, you might have a label that says competition, then, uh, by the way, here you, you see like the description has all the information you'll need about the data. But if it's ever part of a competition, you might have to sign up for the competition before you're able to download the data, just so you know. Now here, this data, it's about uh, people, passengers on the Titanic, whether they did or did not survive. And you can see some of the uh, data, you know, in the data set whether they did survive, you know, Boolean, the passengers class. So that's kind of like, okay, first class, second class, third class, were they rich or poor? The passengers, were they male or female? How old were they? The number of siblings or spouses they had, the number of parents or children they had, um, children's, <laughs> the number of parents or children they had, the second number, how much they paid, what was their cabin number and where did they on board when it comes to these three cities right here. So you can, in Kaggle or wherever you are, download that data, you know, put it in your file directory. But if you're in Kaggle, just click the add data button and it will load up for you. So the first thing we need, so now that we've already gotten the data set from Kaggle, we need to turn the CSV data, comma separated values, into what are called pandas data frames. So just like in NumPy, you have arrays, just like in PyTorch or TensorFlow, you have tensors. By the way, we'll look at those deep learning frameworks later. In pandas, you have data frames. And the way that you can create a data frame is, by the way, up here, I imported pandas as PD, just to make it you know shorter. You'll often see that done in tutorials. As programmers are lazy for the umpteenth time, um, you'll have to run your session and import the thing, which is gonna happen. But you use this pandas function called read underscore CSV. And then you can just put in the path to the data, to the actual CSV file. So if you're following along right now, I'd encourage you to try it out. And by the way, if you're ever confused, you know, how do I get the CSV file paths? One, I'd encourage you to review, you know, how do file paths work in just coding in general. But if you don't want to mess around with that, you can always like uh, hover over the specific file you want. And on the right, you might not be able to see it in the recording, but there's this copy button and it'll let you copy the file path. So if you don't want to worry about anything, then there's your approach, just copy the button. So we have the data now loaded. So train. You know, it's set to the variable there. Uh, that variable is now a pandas data frame. Pandas data frame is kind of like a 2D array. So think of it like a two dimensional matrix, but it's very, you know, nicely formatted. So if I print, you know, the data frame that I get, you'll see it has like all of these, you know, row numbers. So what example is it? And it has the, it has the uh, categories, you know, the column names labeled at the top. Now this is a messy way to see the data. So we have luckily more convenient functions. So don't try and print your data frames. 
Instead, you can use these functions dot head and dot tail, and that you know selects specific rows and then outputs. You know, here are the rows you've selected and the columns. So if I run that, you can see here, it will output a nice table for us so that we can see the data. And you know, that's that's a lot nicer than NumPy arrays, I think you'll agree. So that's one benefit of Pandas data frames. The data looks a lot nicer when we're taking a look here. You can see, you know, 881, 890, these are the passenger numbers. So we, uh, this data set, it has 891 passengers in total. Just if you're curious. Any questions so far? All right, so that's how we load up the data sets. Now, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on like selecting certain data and, you know, how do we, let's say, look at just this one column or how do we just look at this one example or how do we, you know, navigate around this big table. So the first thing we can do is we have this index notation where we can select columns with their names. So if I print, uh, if I just like select train, that's the data frame. And then I pass in the name of the column I want. So the survived column right here. Then I can see, oh yeah, here, here are all of the values. Make sure you put in the right name. If I put like lowercase s, then it's gonna give you what's called a key error. So if you're keeping track of errors, that's one error that you might get. So um, yeah, for now, just use this notation for the column names. Why not? We can also select multiple columns. So the way we do that is we literally pass in, you know, a list of multiple columns. It's like here, I'm passing in a list in the index notation, survived and age. Make sure you don't just put in, you know, multiple column names here. That is not gonna work. That's gonna give you an error. You need to pass in a list, yeah? So that's one common error that I've gotten way too many times. Make sure you pass in a list in the index notation if you want to get multiple columns. So now we can also put in conditional statements into the, into the you know, index notation. That is pretty nice, that's pretty cool. So what I'm doing here is I have this function train.loc and the way that I use this function is when I pass in an index with train.loc, what happens is I can put in conditional expressions. Now look what's happening. So I say train.loc, all the examples, so train.loc, it stands for locate by the way, so locate all the examples in this data frame where the fair columns value, this fair column is greater than 200. And you can see, I get back, you know, all of these examples where the fair is greater than 200. So that's a pretty useful feature. I can put in any conditional expression I want. I can combine conditional expressions too, and you know, something else. So that's a really useful feature. The way this is working behind the scenes is, let me show you. Uh, so let's say I actually, you know, get this conditional expression here and I'll print temp. And, you know, here's uh, train.loc. I'm still just putting in the conditional expression. What's happening behind the scenes is it's creating like a, think of it as a list of Boolean values, you know, true, false, true, false. So for the zero example, the fare is not less than a high, is not you know greater than two hundred, and so on and so on and so on and so on. And then for some cases, so say the twenty seventh, the twenty seventh example or the two hundred ninety ninth example, etc., then the fare is greater than so it has a true value there. Is this making sense? How do you use train dot locate? Okay. It's very useful. Another, again, we're just you know going over different ways to select data. 
you can combine different you know, selections. So this is really complicated. Let me work through it. So first we're locating all the uh, passengers who have a fare that is greater than 200. After that, we are putting in index notation to select you know, the fare and the survived column only. Instead of this entire you know, data frame, we have just the fare and survived column. And then finally, we have this dot tail so that we take the last three examples. And I can run that and you can see I'm getting, you know, exam we found only the passengers with fares over 200, selected only the fare and survived columns, and then got the last three examples. So that's like the first section done, part one, already done. So there's your summary. You have different functions. They're pretty useful. You don't just have to index by, you know, a number, you can index by labels. So it's a lot more, you know, convenient, human readable. You can put in lots of complicated statements here, conditionals, all making sense. Aditya? Uh, why did you put fair and survived in the brackets? Couldn't you have put both of them in the train square bracket one? Uh, here? Yeah. So you get rid of this, the fair and survived list, and then you put the survived element into the train. Yeah. Thing. So good question to clarify. The way that this is working, it's not just selecting the fair column. So the way that this is working, it is going through the entire data set. So train.locate, not you know, train at just the fair column. And then, you know, within that go locate. So this part means search through the entire data sets. What are we searching for? We're searching for examples, you know, rows where the fare is greater than 200. Yeah. So in this case, if I put in, you know, the, and I put in a sub list, the fare or survived is greater than 200. In this case, this is not going to work because, you know, I'm not going to get a direct value. I'm not going to get a number here that I can compare to 200. So over here, this is more like a condition. This is not like a selection. It's like a condition. So select mm -hmm. every single row, including all of the columns where just this one column is greater than 200. And then it's only after that, after I've gotten, you know, this data set with all of the different columns, where I can then say, okay, now go and just select, you know, the fair and survived column. Oh. Okay. Making sense? Yeah, yeah. Good question. Thank you for clarifying. So th those are a few different ways we can select the data in a pandas data frame. Pretty convenient compared to, let's say, having this data in NumPy array. Now let's look at modifying the data. Again, pretty simple. Here's the first way we can modify things to so train at survived. Now you can see up here, you know, it's 0, 01001. 0, 0, 1, yeah. Over here, I just added one. This is like an element wise operation. So now it adds one to each and every row. So now it's like one, two instead of zero, one. Hopefully that's making sense. I can also, uh, just like with a NumPy array, I can, I can get the shape of the, of the data. So I'm going to print out the shape here, train.shape. So the shape of the data frame is 891 examples by 12 columns. And what I'm doing over here is I just selected, you know, 891. That's the number of examples, M. I generated a, a random tensor using NumPy. Sorry, I generated a random NumPy array using NumPy as like dummy data, you know, random data. And then I created a new column. So that's how I do it. I just, you know, create a new index and I set it to a variable. If this column already existed, it would have overwritten the data. And if it doesn't exist, it creates like a new column in the data. And then I set it to this NumPy array. 
And you know, here I'm just printing out the top top few rows. By the way, if you don't put a number in head, it defaults to five. So here you can see, and I have a new column at the end. But let's say I try to overwrite another column. So let's say I did like embarked. Uh, that would overwrite, you know, instead of SC, SS, you know, I would just get 0 0.62, whatever. Like I would get random numbers. So I'm not going to do that right now. Hopefully that's making sense. Any questions on how you do you create a new column? All right. Uh, by the way, you can have any data. You know, you can have strings here. You can have Boolean values, true, falses, whatever. Over here, this is how you drop a drop a column, as in like delete a column. So like drop it off of the data frame. So you call the drop method, and here you know you tell it which column you want it to drop. So over here, I'm just you know dropping the column that I temporarily created. And this is the axis, that's the second parameter, you know, zero, when it's the rows direction, and then one, if it's the columns direction. So I set the axis equal to one, because I wanted to go and search for a new column, you know, in the one direction, one axis. You can see here that I got, you know, rid of this new call that I created earlier. If I set the axis equal to zero, then I could you know, use these indices they're called. So I could say, okay, go search for you know, the third example and then go drop that. Making sense how you delete data? All right. Now here, is a really useful function we'll be using later on when we get into you know how do we deal with messy data there is this function called train.info it gives like a lot of nice info about you know what are we working with so you know it's telling us okay there are 891 entries in this data frame there's 12 columns here's the index of each column uh, there is this thing called non-null so a null value just means like it's blank no one filled in that data. In Python, you'll see null written as not a number. That's what N-A-N stands for, not a number. It just means undefined, null, blank, placeholder. All of these are similar terms. And it will give you like the data type. So the data type is like, okay, the passenger ID, that's a integer. The uh, age, that's a floating point number. Remember that just is a fancy word for a decimal and so on. And then it gives you, you know, here's the amount of size that the data is taking up, 83 kilobytes of space memory. Now we're gonna get a bit into how do we actually clean the data? How do we get it into like a format that's ready to pass into an AI algorithm? Uh, Aditya? I have a question. Can you drop a specific cell? In drop a, a specific cell. Yeah. Does that if you do that, does it just make it make that cell a none? Yeah. Um, usually you wouldn't drop that cell. Usually you would set that specific cell to a certain um, index. So you would set it to a certain value. So for example, like train at passenger ID, yeah? And mm -hmm. then I index a specific uh, row. Does this work? Let's see. Yes, it does. So here's a specific column. Here's a specific row. And then I could set that, you know, to null. Well, actually, sorry, not in Python. I can't set it to null. In Python, I have to set it to none with a capital N. And that's how you might, you know, erase that cell's value. Let's carry on here. Next, you know, we're gonna modify the data. We're gonna deal with the mess. If there are, you know, empty values, if there are uh, issues with the data. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is over here, we have the sex, male, female, ma female, male. 
AR chrisms can't understand, you know, this is what this text means. In general, whenever we're working in AI, there's like this entire field called natural language processing. It will always convert the text into numbers. So in this case, we want to go from male, female to like some kind of number. And now in the context of this data set, so we're trying to predict who survived. Females were more likely to survive because they got first access to lifeboats when the Titanic was sinking. So instead of having like sex, male, female, we could probably like simplify our use case. Just are they female? Zero if no, one, uh, one if yes. And that will probably be like a good useful variable for us to create a theta parameter on. Let's say if we're doing logistic regression. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a new column, train at female. And I'm going to say, I'm going to set it to this conditional value. So is train at the sex column, which already exists, is that equal to female? This is an element wise conditional. So it goes through each element in train at sex, each example, and it checks is this female? Zero if one, you know, it, it does it uh, true or false. And keep in mind, you know, I showed you earlier, I printed out a conditional like this, it's just creating a really long array, a really long list of true and falses. Then I drop the uh, former, you know, sex column because I don't need that anymore. Axis equals one. And I'm printing out, you know, the top bit. You'll see now I have this column. Now it's like female, false, true, true, false. You know, it's just true, false values. That's not quite what I want. So what I want is like zeros and ones. The way I can do that is by changing the data type. So I'm going to do this, train at female, and then I have dot as type. If I use the dot as type method, I can put in, you know, whatever data type I want in there. So in this case, I'm going to put in an integer, zero or one. And in this case, uh, I just already deleted the, um, the sex column from the train data frame. That's what it's saying, key error sex. So there's another debugging thing for you. Uh, so I'm just going to hash this out, you know, comment it out because I don't need it anymore. Let's see. Oh, yeah, always. Yeah, I can't even run this. So I'm going to go back and get the sex column. I'm going to reload my data up here. So reload. Now I actually have the sex column. Yeah. And now I can go back and rerun this, the rerun this block and it will work this time. And you can now see, okay, I have zeros and ones instead of trues and falses. Cool. All right, that's how you might convert Boolean data or any type of data where you have two binary options into integers. So that's one kind of data cleaning that you'll do. Another type of data cleaning you'll do is turning what is called categorical data into numbers. Remember, categorical data means like one of a few options. So for example, the uh, passenger could be a child an adult or a senior, you know, one of a few options. It's not continuous. It's not like, oh, yeah, you can have like a fair of 7.25 or 71.28 or 7.925, like you can have a bunch of fares. So it's not a number. We want to get the categorical data, you know, a few options into numbers. So we want to map each class. Remember, the class is like, you know, either a senior adult or child into a number. So here you can see an example of categorical data, you know, which city did the passenger embark in? This is important because some of the cities were like low income ports, some of them were higher income. So that's why, you know, it's used to predict who survived and who didn't. Because, you know, who got a lifeboat when the Titanic was going down? 
the first approach we're going to do is like literally whenever we see a S, we might put in like a zero. Whenever we see a C, we might put in a one. Whenever we see a Q, uh, that's um, each city, you know, we might we might put in a two. So the way we do that is first we tell uh, pandas, hey, by the way, this is categorical data. We do that by setting the type to cate category. Then we can get the categories. These are like the little, the literal, you know, strings we see. So S, C, and Q. When we use this property dot cat dot categories, I'll print it out for you in just a second. And then we can get the numbers that you know those have been mapped to zero, one, and two with dot cat dot codes. So these two attributes. I'm going to print these out to, for you so you can see them. So you can see here, you know, C, Q, and S, that's dot cat dot categories. And each of these has been mapped to, you know, S is in the second position here. So that's the number two. C is in the zeroth position. So that's the number zero. Q is in the first position. So it's the number one. So it took each, you know, each example in this series and you know map the output from categorical data into numbers. I'm quickly going to create you know just a uh, list, you know a dictionary so I can I can go from you know the category to the code to and the code to the category later. This is what's often called a mapping. So what I'm doing is I'm going through the you know this list over here and then, I just said, you know, here's the category. You know, it's this, it's the zeroth element, the first time, second element in the list. And then I have like one dictionary where I go from, okay, here's the category as the key. And then here's the value as the value. <laughs> here's the index, sorry, here's the number as the value. And then over here, here's the index the number value. And then here's the actual string. CQRS. Here's an example of the dictionary. So C is zero, Q one, S two. Finally, you see, you know, I have all of these codes here. So I just set train at embarked from up here. It was S C Q S C Q whatever. Now I just have these numbers two zero two 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 dot dot dot, and it came from this attribute dot cat dot codes making sense so question was what is dot cats dot cat is just an attribute that uh, pandas creates for this column when you set the type to a category category means it's categorical data this refers to at C, Q, and S, this uh, list. This refers to, you know, this big, long, you can call it an array uh, of codes, you know, the maps. Here's the, here's the number that each uh, category maps to. So this is one approach to dealing with, again, categorical data. That means we have these text classes but we don't, we can't use that in machine learning. We need to get numbers. And the approach just, you know, created a map, basically. That's what it's called, map, where C goes to like zero, Q goes to one, and S goes to two. And over here, we just saved, you know, the map. So we created Python dictionaries that look like this, that just tell us, oh, by the way, C is now zero, Q is now one, S is now two. There is an issue here, if you think about it, because like the next thing that we're going to do with this data, let's say we pass it into a logistic regression algorithm, then it's going to you know multiply two by a number like a parameter, and then it's going to multiply zero by a parameter, and it's going to multiply one by a parameter. So that's going to influence the logistic regression algorithm, but it's not like you know the values have any particular meaning. It's not like oh if the you know, participant is from S, you know, this city, 
then that value is greater. That that means something more than if the value is from C, you know, the, the passengers from the the city C, Cherbourg. And that value is zero. So like the numbers have no particular significance here. That's why we have an alternative approach. It's called one hot encoding. So this is again an approach to turn categorical data, these S, C, and Qs, you know, but one of a few limited possibilities into numbers. The way one hot encoding works is we just create Boolean values for each class. So instead of, you know, oh, the participant, the passenger is from Cherbourg, you know, let's give that one a zero or Queenstown, let's give that one a one. Instead, we're like, okay, is the participant from Cherbourg zero or one, true or false? Is the participant from Queenstown zero or one, true or false? Is the participant for every other class? You know, we go through every class and create zero and one values, Booleans. Let me show you with visuals. So maybe that makes a bit sense, a bit more sense. This approach is called one hot encoding because like it's like you get one in some places and zeros everywhere else. It's also called getting dummy data. So getting one hot data or getting dummy data. That's why the pandas function is called get underscore dummies. You just pass in, you know, the column you want to create dummy data or one hot data for. So the embarked column. Let me print out what we get. So we get, you know, for the zeroth class, remember embarked, you know, has zero, one, and two now. So for the zeroth class, that's corresponding to Cherbourg. Did the passenger board on Cherbourg? Well, no, the first one did not. The second one did, third one did not, and so on and so on. And you can see like all the way through, we have these, um, we have these ones and zeros that say, okay, did the passenger on board on each of the cities? Now there's also a negative one column here. Negative one is like the value that gets assigned. If um, it's like, okay, it's none of the above options. So the passenger didn't on board on any of these cities. That's what we get when we have null data. So as you can see here, we have a few, you know, exactly two passengers. There's 891 passengers, 889 of them are not null, but two of them, we don't know. So that's why we had this like negative one column showed up, show up. We're gonna deal with that just a little bit later. For now, I'm just gonna, you know, plug in this one hot data into the pandas data frame. The way that I do that is one, I'm gonna drop this negative one for now. I'm gonna deal with this nan null data later. Two, I'm going to rename, you know, the columns from zero, one, and two to here. I just uh, pass in the dictionary I created, the map, where it goes from like, let's say zero is the value, the code, to the category, C is the category. So that's why I created that Python dictionary earlier. So that's the first thing I did. I just uh, dropped this first column of NANs and I re renamed the columns from zero, one, and two to C, Q, and S. Finally, I just, you know, plug in the data back into the array. I use the pd.concat function. That means concatenate. I just pass in a list of like what I want to concatenate. So the train, you know, data frame, first of all, as we see it here, all of this stuff. And then I wanna add on these one hot columns, all of this stuff. And the axis just means, by the way, don't like, you know, make them as new rows, actually add them as separate columns. So that's what this is saying, pd.concat. I'm dropping the old embarked column, you know, the one we had here, because now we have one hot data, not categorical data. And then I'm just displaying the head. You can see now we have these uh, one hot encoded or dummy encoded columns. Um, I have a question. When you do the, when you make the get dummies, are the headers um, integers or strings? Yeah, so I originally, again, this was just me playing around with the code. 
I originally, you know, just put in put in uh, strings here, but uh, when I ran that, it wasn't working. So I was like, what's going on? There's a cure. So I tried, you know, putting in numbers. All right, one last thing and then we're done. So again, you know, this problem occurred up here. We have a few errors, but it occurred earlier where we had like a few null values. So over here, you know, with the age, you can see there's about a hundred null values. With the, with the cabins, you know, there's like almost all of them are null. You know, there's like 600 null values. So how do we deal with undefined data? You're often gonna have to deal with undefined data. There are a few approaches. So just like there were a few approaches with converting categorical to numerical data, there's a few approaches for dealing with undefined data. Easiest approach, just drop the column, ignore the null data. So here what I'm doing is train.locate. You know, again, I'm searching for the entire database based on this condition that the age column over here, that the age column is not null. That's what this method does, dot not null. And I'm setting it to this uh, new pandas data frame, not null. And like I'm printing the info now, you can see Oh, it uh, only took like the 714 examples where age was not null. That's why we now have 714 examples total. This may be feasible. You can ignore the null data if you know you only have a small percentage of your data is null. In this case, you know it's a fairly large chunk because we only have like about 800 examples, so that's like 12 and a half percent of our data gone. So maybe not the best approach, but you can ignore the null data sometimes if it's like a very small percent of your data set. Okay, that's the first approach. Just drop the null data by finding, you know, what are the values that are not null. Another approach is a bit more complicated. So you can analyze the problem. You can look at the context. So here's like some context here. I can see a bunch of the cabins are, you know, not null, that they are null. Only a few of them are not null. And my hypothesis is that this is because the upper class passengers on the Titanic, they were given a cabin, they were assigned you know, a cabin on their tickets, whereas the lower classes were just like, yeah, whatever, get in the hall. That's uh, not realistic, but you know, that's one example of a contextual hypothesis I could have. The way I could test this hypothesis is I wanna see, you know, if this is true, then it shouldn't matter to me, you know, what is the cabin value? Is it like C85, C123 or none? All I care about was, it, do they have a cabin or do they not? Yeah? So if they have a cabin, then they, uh, then that, for me, my hypothesis is that means they're upper class and they're more likely to survive. If they don't have a cabin, then that just means, yeah, they're lower class, they're less likely to survive. So what I need to do is I need to figure out, well, is the uh, cabin data, is that is that correlated with someone's survival? Here's how I'll do it. First, I just convert, you know, the cabin column to basically a Boolean column. I do that by, you know, train.locate. I select all the rows where the cabin data is not known. So they have some cabin, I don't care, you know, which one. Then, I also go through and then I figure out, okay, of these people who have a cabin, how many of them survived? So what I do is I create this value variable, has cabin and survived. It's where the has cabin rows, you know, the rows where they actually have a cabin, where the survived column there is equal to one. And then I just wrap it in brackets so that I can put like this method at the end as type int. That's just like a quick way of doing the same thing as, you know, this on two lines as cabin and survived is equal to as cabin and survived. Oh, that's the uh, dot as type int. 
So that's just that was just like a quick way of doing this. And once I've you know converted everything to an int, then I'm gonna have like one if they had a cabin, zero if they did not. Uh, sorry, one if they had a cabin and survived, zero if they did not. So I'm just gonna you know sum up all the ones where they had a cabin and survived. Divide by the length of this. By the way, the length is the same way as getting the number of examples. So the, the number of people who had a cabin. And then I can figure out, okay, of the people who survived, how many, you know, of the people who had a cabin, how many actually survived? So I'm printing this out here. I'm getting an error because I do not have uh, a survive column. Why is that? It survived within. Ah. Two. Oops. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. So you can see here 66%. So two thirds of the people who had a cabin, they did survive. Now, that doesn't sound like much because it's like, oh, it's like 50 50, but it's quite a lot because we're going to be able to combine this with other information. So my hypothesis turned out to be correct. If, the, if they had a cabin, they were more likely to survive. So what I do in this case is I would just create, you know, a has cabin um, column. I would just get rid of the cabin column entirely and just replace it with, you know, just this Boolean column, zero or one, did they have a cabin? Finally, one last thing, assume the most likely option. <laughs> So here's the OG data again, you know, the original without all of these modifications. You can see over here, cabin, uh, sorry, embarked, it had actually two uh, null values that I didn't address at the beginning. One way I could address that is I could literally, um, I could use what is called the dot mode function. So I'm gonna print this out for you here. Uh, mode is just like statistics mode, you know, what is the most common option? I'm just seeing what is the most common city. So you can see I get back this object that says uh, Sherborg. That's the, sorry, that's not Sherborg. The S city is the most common city. And then I just selected, you know, the first element here, the first row, zero. And then I just get back an S. And at the end, I just, you know, the embarked data. It selects the is null columns and it's going to be equal to uh, S. However, there's an error here. Okay, let me explain the error. This is like calling a function. You know, it's returning a bunch of true false values. It's not actually locating those columns in the data frame. So this is the correct thing we want to do. The conditional is in the object notation, we have the dot lo locate function. And now we can do this. So now you'll see if I do like OG data dot info, we replaced those two null values with just, you know, the most common city. And now we don't have any null, null values. We can also do the same with like averages, means, modes, whatever. So, you know, choose the most common option. Make sense? Any questions? That's it. That's how we process data. All right, I'm not getting any questions. At the end, you might want to save your data after you've done all the processing. There's a few options here as well. One is you could just uh, save to CSV. So you use the dot to CSV method and just pass in like a file path over here. And on the side, you'll see in the output slash working directory. Now there's like a train.csv. You could also save as a NumPy array. You'd want to do that for algorithms once you have converted all the text to numbers. So in this case, I'd have to drop, you know, all these uh, values that I didn't convert to numbers, you know, name, ticket, and class. And then I just use the dot to NumPy method. I get back a NumPy array. And I can show you like the shape of the array now. So it's 891 examples by, you know, 11 rows. And then I just use NumPy's built-in save function, 
I put uh, the file name, you know, the path, the directory I want to save in, and then the object, which is this variable. And again, I can reload here and you'll see now I've got a train.numpy, you know, I've got this. I could also, option three, save as a deep learning framework object. You know, same as in numpy array, everything has to be a number, but it's less flexible and you have to deal with more errors. So basically don't do this unless you know, you know, you're ready to get started working on your algorithm. Because now let's say I'm using PyTorch, then I have to um, process the data into a PyTorch format. So I would actually use a PyTorch function. First, I would create a NumPy, you know, a NumPy object. Then I would go torch dot from NumPy and then pass in the NumPy object. And then to save it, I have to, you know, use the save function in PyTorch, torch.save. This time the syntax is different from above. You put the variable first, then the training, uh, then the, sorry, the, the path, the file path. This dot PT just means a dot PyTorch. By the way, you saw this line of code here. I had to convert actually the NumPy uh, data type to float32. This is like a technical bug I had to debug. I was getting an error, I had to search it up on Stack Overflow. So that's what I mean. Uh, if you're doing like, if you're saving as a deep learning framework object, then it's gonna be, you're gonna have to de you know debug more. You're gonna have to figure out different issues. So if you wanna save as numbers, then make sure to use NumPy. Otherwise, you know, just leave it as CSV. It's good for sharing with other people. It's human understandable. Last thing is you might want to compress your data sometimes. You have um, you have Python modules like joblib. There's another one called pickle. Basically, they just compress your data because you might be saving, you know, hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes of data. Uh, you just use a dump function and then you just, you know, you can pass in any Python object here. So the, in this case, I'm using a NumPy array, but I could also put in the tensor. I could put in a regular Python list. You know, I could put in whatever. Here's the file path. I can set the compression level from zero. That means no compression to nine. That means maximum compression. I'll run this. And over here, hopefully you can see this on my screen. If I hover over this, you know, with no compression, the file size is 78 kilobytes. With maximum compression, the file is seven kilobytes. So you can see like 10 times file savings. Now imagine if it's like seven gigabytes versus one gigabyte. So this is really important sometimes. And finally, you know, I can reload the data using joblib.load, joblib.dump, joblib.load, just pass in the uh, file path, and you know, here's the shape of the NumPy array again. Cool. Uh, when you compress it a lot, are some features being um, dropped? No. Joblib does magic. Pickle does too. <laughs> um, so that is some cool stuff right there. I wanted to tell you if you're ever using Kaggle, there's going to be this button on the right that says save version make sure you click that, okay? And make sure it says like save and run all, commit, and then click on save. That will make sure all of these things you have in the output, all of these files, they actually stay stable. Otherwise, if you're like unsure, you can always like right click on the files. There, there's gonna be like a, a three dots and you can download the files. So make sure you save your files properly. If you're working locally, then you don't have that issue. With that being said, Here's what I want you to do, okay? Go on Kaggle, go get your own data set, go try and process it, go deal with you know, null objects, go deal with which columns you actually wanna select. Here's something that I'm gonna leave you as a homework assignment. Search up this function, um, this function called pd.core, okay? Dot .core. It creates statistical correlations. It shows you, you know, which columns are correlated with which ones. Uh, I might quickly demo this. So if I have, you know, my train data sets up here, yeah, train, I could do train 
dot core. And look, it gives me like statistical correlations. So passenger ID, it's a it's one. So that's like 100% correlated with passenger ID, which makes sense. They're the same thing. But what we really want is this survived class. So what is correlated with survived? So like, okay, uh, there's like a negative 3% correlation between the passenger class as the number gets higher. So as they get from like first class to third class, then the uh, passenger ID, you know, it changes. But what we want is this survived column. So you can see here, passenger class, as it goes up from first class to third class, the survival rate goes down by 33, you know, percent. So that's like the correlation. That's a negative correlation. That means we can use this feature to predict, you know, what's going on with survived. Uh, with age, you know, there's a less strong correlation. It's only 7%. With fare, the more fare they paid, then there's a positive correlation, 0 0.25. Uh, you, I'll leave like a video in the description about how correlations work. But this is how you'd, you know, go about doing feature selection. Which features actually matter? Which features do I want to keep? You can see the most important feature is female. So if they were female, and that's why I created the zero and one value, then it's like a positive correlation. So the females are, you know, there's a 54% correlation with survival. I'll leave again a video to understand, you know, what does correlation mean visually? You can also, if you don't like looking at numbers, you can import something called Seaborn. That's like a plotting library. You can do seaborn.heatmap, I think. And then you can, you know, input this core. So let's say core is equal to that. And then I can pass in the core. So this variable, and it will generate like a heat map where darker values, you know, that means less correlation, lighter values like this orange, you know, female and survived, you can see here, that means like a lighter correlation. So anyways, that's one last thing or based on like which features you actually want to keep around. You don't want to keep around all the features if they're not, you know, helpful to you. So with that being said, go explore, Kaggle, data set, search, and figure out, you know, which features do I want to keep? How do I deal with the, how do I deal with the uh, null data? How do I, how do I go about and visualize the data? This is like only the beginning of visualization. So much more you can do there. Search up like Seaborn, Matplotlib, all of these libraries. Go figure out, you know, how do I plot different data? How do I plot pie charts, line charts, bar charts? Visualization is such a huge part. So hopefully that is my challenge to you. You accept, hopefully you learn a lot because I literally like, I'm giving you one function here about visualizing the data. There is so much more that you should be doing. Cool.